push back the new Japanese offensive in Burma. Before the summer monsoons break, three armies strike fast to stop the enemy. Refugees from Burma are moved away from the fighting front. In this sector, Brigadier General Frank Merrill's men, the Marauders, moved to cut off Jap supply lines in Nitkiena, chief enemy base in North Burma. They are shown here in Signal Corps pictures on their way to new scenes of battle as the ever-present beggars scramble for coins. There's tea and a Burma shave before they move on to a bivouac area and a brief rest in camp. Mail. Those letters from home that mean more than anyone knows. And a letter opener. Or maybe it isn't a letter opener. Decorations from General Merrill to some of his boys. The toughest fighting men in this man's army. The Japs said that Burma's mountains and jungles would be impassable for our troops. Merrill's marauders are showing just how wrong they were. On the Imphal front, we push back new forces of 50,000 Japanese. At a nearby training base, Lord Mountbatten and Major General Wingate arrive. These are among the last pictures of Wingate, the famed guerrilla leader, before his tragic death. In the north, Lieutenant General Stilwell's forces continue their steady drive down the Mogong Valley. Their objective? To reopen land connections with China through the Lido Road. American-trained Chinese troops push ahead, while Vinegar Joe works out details of things to come. Then, jungle battle. Jap soldiers have been killed for every Allied soldier lost. Our forces here have been aided by fresh reinforcements of glider-borne guerrilla fighters, new Allied tactics of infiltration by air, and new victories in perhaps the toughest area of the entire war. An interlude from battle, a celebration on Uncle Joe Stilwell's 61st birthday, a chocolate cake. The jungle headquarters cook slaved over a hot stove to say happy birthday, Uncle Joe, and many more victories. Three little strangers have come to live with Mrs. Fred Martini in her Bronx apartment. Their mother has refused to support her 10-week-old triplets. Why? Well, you see, she's a tigress named Jenny who didn't like the idea of having her cubs born in captivity. And Mr. Martini is Jenny's keeper at the Bronx Zoo. So it's cats in the kitchen, cubs in the parlor of the Martini household until the junior tigers are big enough to go on a meat diet. Then they'll go home to mother. Feeding time, the babies fight for their formula. Mama wears gloves because the little darlings have claws. She's an old hand at this, having once brought up a lion cub in her kitchen. These triplets weigh 15 pounds apiece, but grown up, they'll weigh 350. Tame and playful enough now, but what with meat rationing and the bad manners tigers often develop, they won't be welcome around the house next year. London is jammed with soldiers as the world faces the burning question of the invasion. Censorship tightens, and in a swift move, Britain freezes foreign diplomats and clamps down on their communications. The BBC sends broadcast after broadcast to the people of conquered Europe, who hear the messages of hope they've been waiting for. Across the channel, Goering broadcasts feverishly, using every trick in the Nazi propaganda bag. <laughs> DF, 
the daring reconnaissance raid by British and Canadians in 1942. These captured German films show coastal guns that have been increased many times in number since that date. Our raiders were surprised by German e-boats that hot muggy night. The Nazis have tried to make Kiev appear a failure. The British declared it a success, pointing out that the lessons learned there were invaluable. Kiev caused heavy casualties, and we must expect increased tolls in the coming invasion, as Churchill and Eisenhower have warned. In August 1942, Kiev was the story of too little and too late. only 28 tanks at Kiev. D-Day will see hundreds upon hundreds of tanks, tanks that have proved themselves in Tunisia, Burma, Sicily. We had only 60 ships at Kiev. Many of them never returned to England. D-Day, there will be hundreds, perhaps thousands of ships, undoubtedly the greatest armada in history. We had 500 planes at DF, many of which did not return. The RAF loss was heavy. For D-Day, planes in vast numbers, thousands of planes, planes that have wrested control of the skies from the Luftwaffe. Planes and invading parachutists for Europe's liberation. Some 6,000 men were at the F. 170 dead, 633 wounded, 2,547 missing among the 5,000 Canadians who landed. D-Day will see millions of men, men who have been trained relentlessly in the tactics of invasion. Number, the day, and the hour is the secret of Eisenhower, Tedder, and Montgomery. The equipment is ready. The men are ready. For us at home, it must be a time for prayer, for faith, for sacrifice. We must not fail. the Soldier Week in London and a grim pre-invasion parade of American military might. It's the Yanks' own show today as they march past Nelson's monument toward Trafalgar Square, past the greatest turnout of British people since the coronation. Snappy white-helmeted MPs get a big hand from Londoners and a salute from Lieutenant General Lee, acting for a very busy General Eisenhower. And today an unusual occurrence. Traditional British reserve breaks down. Londoners, who are supposed never to cheer, loudly acclaim the Americans. All England salutes the American soldier, comrade in arms in the great struggle to come. Yanks, who await zero hour. Across the nation, our third Easter at war. 650,000 jam Fifth Avenue, and rain sets the style for umbrellas. Mr. and Mrs. Henry Kaiser are among the paraders. Spanish motifs get the nod, and even dogs wear colorful bonnets. But the big colors are khaki and blue. Sunrise over the unknown soldier's tomb on this holy day, as Knights Templar assemble to hear a prayer for victory by General Marshall. 
Give us strength, O Lord, that we may be pure in heart and in purpose to the end that there may be peace on earth and goodwill among men. Cherry blossoms along the Potomac are the big attraction in wartime Washington this Easter. In spite of the tension and strain before invasion in the capital, it's glorious weather for our wax and waves and spars and women marines. At Fort Benning, 15,000 soldiers gather together in solemn prayer. A sunrise service on this day that joins peoples and creeds and links the past with the present. A prayer for strength from soldiers of faith. three out of every four Americans see a moving picture once a week in 18,000 movie houses. But in this New York City shoe store just 50 years ago, the motion picture had its first paying audience. For a quarter, the spectator could peek into five of the new kinetoscopes, product of Thomas A. Edison's inventive genius. Later, when Edison improved the early projector, a new art that was destined to encircle the world was born. Nickelodeons, or nickel theaters, sprang up all over. What the spectators saw would make them laugh, like this Edison comedy, The Barber Shop. They could see William McKinley in action, or young Teddy Roosevelt, his vice president. In France, meanwhile, film pioneer Georges Méliès and his trick camera amazed and baffled American movie makers. How did he do it, they asked, and strove vainly to imitate his magic. Edison's Life of an American Fireman was then sensational and the first film to use a continuity of scenes to tell a story, the principle of modern film editing. It had everything, thrills, chills, and a daring last-minute rescue. of drink were graphically portrayed, too, in this melodrama, which had 1,910 audiences sitting on the edge of their seats. Behind the curtain, Honest Dan the Burglar. Take that, you cad. Watch out again! A new figure was rising on the motion picture scene, Adolf Zucker, truly a founder of the industry. From France in 1912, this pioneer executive brought a four-reel film drama starring the great Sarah Bernhardt. The new era of name stars was at hand. Remember the slides? And remember these early stars? William F. Hart, Ola Negri, Wally Reed. Maybe you can name the rest. Great stars and directors like D.W. Griffith and Cecil B. DeMille. C.B. pioneered with films like King of Kings and the Ten Commandments.
America's sweetheart, Mary Pickford, in a World War film with Jack Holt. Now the plot. Then the Sheik, Rudolph Valentino, and Agnes Ayres in Unforgettable Romance. The covered wagon sweeping panorama of the American plains. Then sound, the movies talk, discs, then sound on film, and audiences that had watched silent lips suddenly heard dialogue. From interference, William Powell with Evelyn Brent. Well then, for what it's worth to you, and what you're worth to me, I love you. From the Virginian. You want to call me that? Smile. In She Done Him Wrong, Cary Grant listens to Mae West. You're kidding me, Eddie. You know, I met you a time before. From its primitive days, the 50-year-old motion picture industry has grown to giant stature. Hollywood's technical artistry, its scientific skill in make-believe, has given America an industry employing 200,000 that hundreds of millions may have the best in entertainment. Camera cranes, miracles of film and artistry and music have grown from Edison's flickering kinetoscope. Sparkling entertainment. Miracles of makeup, lest this nation should forget that man. Movies for the boys over there. More than 10,000 first run features for 3,000 makeshift theaters in Italy, Guadalcanal, and Burma. A bit of home sent by Hollywood. Back home in New York City, Secretary Morgenthau receives the movie's fourth war loan book, marking 69 million bonds sold. The motion picture industry with salvage appeals. Red Cross drives and emergency messages backs up the boys out there. Motion picture films train troops, and cameras bring the war story back to Main Street in vivid portraits of battle. anniversary of motion pictures, Mr. Barney Balaban, president of Paramount Pictures, says, We are proud of the motion picture industry's first 50 years. The second half century offers a challenge of new responsibilities and new opportunities, which I am confident the industry will meet. The most immediate job is to go on doing everything within its power to help win the war. I believe the motion picture can also be an important factor in winning a lasting peace. After the war, movies can and will play a considerable part in promoting world fellowship, tolerance, understanding, and interchange of ideas. We of Paramount pledge that in the future, as in the past, we will devote our skill and our resources to see that motion pictures continue to be your greatest entertainment in a better world. 